Factfulness by Hans Rosling, Ola Rosling, and Anna Rosling Brunlund. You know what really struck me about this book? 10 reasons we're wrong about the world and why things are better than you think. Like, how do they know what we think about the world? How do they know what we think? How are we wrong? And where the heck are they getting all this information? Also, I have to know, how are the three authors related? I've never heard of this before, where three authors who are related put a book together. It reminds me of a song I wrote long ago where the lyrics were saying, life is better than you think. People stress about the past like the present don't exist. People stress about the past and they wonder where it went. Tell me what's a pessimist. Tell me what's a pessimist. No. Tell me about this book. Yeah. Yeah. Let me tell you about this book. Just so you guys know, there are affiliate links in the description. If you buy anything through those links, like maybe this book, then I get commission, which helps me build this channel and keep making these videos. You can also find this book and many others on my Amazon storefront. Welcome back to my channel. My name is Sam and I want to make self growth normal because people shouldn't have to look this information up. It should just be mainstream knowledge. If you agree, then please make sure to smash that like button. So let's start with the authors because uh, again, uh, what the heck? Ola is Hans's son and Anna is his daughter-in-law. So I don't know about you guys, but I could never imagine imagine my dad writing a book with my brother and my fiance. That is so strange to me. Um, I almost wonder how it came about. But simply put, the authors said this book is about the world and how to understand it. The authors share a set of global thinking tools that will help us get the big picture right and improve our senses of how the world works without us having to learn all the details. Over the past decades, Hans proposed hundreds of fact questions about poverty and wealth, population growth, births, deaths, education, gender, violence and the environment to thousands of people worldwide. Most people cannot answer them correctly or close to correctly. And the author basically broke down, I'll just say the author because it kind of sounds like Hans was at like the forefront of a lot of this and he sort of shared it with the family members who wrote the book with him. But when I say the author, I'm going to refer to all three of them. But yeah, the author basically broke down in the introduction that the world is contrary to popular belief, generally becoming less poverty stricken and less unhealthy. So each one of these chapters is about an instinct that people have regarding the world and and how it's getting worse and how it's really not that way. <laughs> but each chapter is named after one of these instincts that, that they came up with. And the first chapter is the gap instinct. He uses four different levels of income to describe income distribution. Level one is less than $2 a day. Level two is two to $8 a day. Level three is eight to $32 a day. And level four is $32 a day or more. It is divided as lower middle, upper middle, and high income. This kind of confused me because uh, honestly in America, especially in 2023, like what the hell? $32 a day, that's not gonna get you anything. It's not exactly relatable. It, it did occur to me though that maybe the way that they explain this went over my head, um, but I listened to this section like twice just trying to understand it. I think it was a relativity thing. Over a billion people are in each one of these though, and, and it may explain how I didn't understand it very well is that most people in the fourth level have trouble gripping what it means to be below them. The less money you make, the more any money at all makes a difference in your life. So I, I think it would make sense as to why it might not make sense to me or you or anyone who checks out the book and they're like, what the heck? Is this? Whenever I think about you know certain numbers uh, in accordance to inflation, this book came out in April 2018, which was two years before everybody knows what. But chapter two is the negativity instinct. I like how each chapter is about an instinct people have on each topic it tackles. At, as for this one, we're subjected to never-ending cascades of negative news across the world. Wars, famines, natural disasters, political mistakes, corruptions, budget cuts, diseases, mass layoffs, and acts of terror. Journalists who reported flights that didn't crash or crops that didn't fail, they would lose their jobs. It's pathetic to think about, honestly, in my opinion. Uh, but we should still be concerned when these horrible things happen, but it's it's just as stressful and ridiculous to look away at the progress that's been made. The author referred to himself as a possibilist, someone who believes that progress is reasonably possible. Chapter three, the straight line instinct. I think in some weird ways, this book is kind of like what Freakonomics should have been. Here's an example. Doubling is scary. I first learned about the effect of doubling at school. In the Indian legend, the Lord Krishna asks for one grain of rice on the chessboard, then two grains of rice in the second square, four grains on the third square, then eight and so on, doubling the number of grains each time. By the time he gets to the last of the 64 squares, he is owed 18 quintillion, 446 quadrillion, 744 trillion, 73 billion, 790 
9,551,615 grains of rice, enough to cover the whole of India with a layer of rice 30 inches deep. Anything that keeps doubling grows much faster than we first assume. And chapter four is the fear instinct. Uh, a lot of fear in the world comes down to media influence, quite frankly, and the way that the author discussed this didn't involve any complex psychology terms, which I really liked. It did not involve these tricky statistics, which I also really liked. It was just simple and easy to understand, which makes it much more accessible to the average reader or listener. What I loved about it so much is that it also didn't reek of like conspiratorial or political accusations. When we hear about heart-wrenching events, our fears and sorrows they do take over and our intellectual capacities are blocked. No line chart in the world can influence our feelings and no facts can comfort us in this case scenario. In these situations, we really have to do anything we can to help and forget the bigger picture for short-term benefit. Chapter five is the size instinct. It is instinctive to judge, misjudge mem numbers and the media, who the author tends to harp on often, if you can't tell by now, uh, knows it's almost inhuman to look away from numbers that seem important. Proportion of students vaccinated, 88%. Proportion of people with electricity, 85%. Proportions of girls in primary school, 90%. I don't know why he gave these examples and what they were pertaining to, but I'm guessing the media wouldn't. Um, Cause they sound pretty positive. When he started talking about millions of dead babies though, I, I can't say I was comfortable, but, but that did sort of reinforce his point. Chapter six, the generalization instinct. I love the word generalization because it's like an instinct to make and use them, but it makes perfect sense why even though there are ways it doesn't it doesn't help us. We need generalizations to make sense of things and to categorize them. When someone makes a single example and wants to draw a conclusion out of a group, however, here's an interesting piece of advice I heard from the book. Ask whether an opposite example would make them draw the opposite conclusion. D you could just do with that whatever you want, but I take very seriously the notion, um, and I have for years in my life now, that we do not know what we don't know. So I wholeheartedly agree with the author when he says that when presented with new evidence, it is a good idea to always be ready to question our previous assumptions and reevaluate and admit when we are wrong. Chapter seven, the destiny instinct. The destiny instinct seems to revolve around a set in stone faith. It's the idea that innate characteristics determine the destinies of people, countries, religions, or cultures. It's the idea that things are the way they are for inescapable reasons, they will always be this way, and they will never change. What I like that the author does beyond introducing each instinct with the story from his own experience, he has a lot of it, this guy comes from medicine, is that he'll talk in the beginning of describing these instincts about how they make sense for us to have, especially from an evolutionary standpoint. It just added a lot of well-roundedness to the book. With this one, for example, he said that claiming a destiny around your group can help empower it and unite it around a never changing purpose. However, he said it can blind us to cultures around us that change. This book was so interesting. <laughs> it really was. Uh, and then chapter a, the single perspective instinct. There were a few fantastic rants, maybe not rants, um, maybe more tangents about how things should be versus how they are regarding the attitudes of activists in human rights and environmentalism, as well as the healthcare system in the US. Um, what really hooked me in this chapter was when he explained that many big pharmaceutical companies are focused on you know, that next revolutionary medication that's gonna make the biggest difference in the lives of those who take it. When what they really should be focused on right now is a change in business model. But overall, he did say that there is no single indicator through which we can measure the progress of a nation because reality is just much, much, much more complicated than that. Chapter nine, the blame instinct. Uh, I fall victim to this so bad so often. It's the instinct to find a clear, simple reason why something bad has happened. The reason bad things happen, when you really think about what the intentions are of any given party, it's never that simple of an explanation, but assuming it is causes us to stop looking for explanations elsewhere, which distracts us from focusing our energy on the right things. The amount of examples throughout this chapter was pretty astonishing, I'd say, compared to the rest of the chapters. I wouldn't say that's a turnoff or anything, though. And lastly, the urgency instinct. Being humble means being aware of how difficult your instincts can make it to get the facts right. It means being realistic about the extent of your knowledge. It means being happy to say you don't know. It also means when you do have an opinion, being prepared to change it when you discover new facts. It's quite relaxing being humble because it means you can stop feeling pressured to have a view about everything. He also talked about being curious, which stood out too. Being curious means being 
being open to new information and actively seeking it out. It means embracing facts that don't fit your worldview and trying to understand their implications. It means letting your mistakes trigger curiosity instead of embarrassment. The world just needs more humility and curiosity. We do need new ways to update adults' knowledge and not just kids. Uh, but if I'm not mistaken, this book would be a very fair starting point at that. Quotes. The Democrats and Republicans in the United States often claim that their opponents don't know the facts. If they measured their own knowledge instead of pointing at each other, maybe everyone could become more humble. The risks feared the most are often the risks that actually cause us the least harm. Everyone automatically categorizes and generalizes all the time. Don't confuse slow change with no change. Forming your worldview by the media would be like forming your view of me by looking at my foot. Direction one. I recommend this book for someone whose view of the world is starting to get sour. And recently I feel like personally I have been experiencing this a little. Um, like I'm turning 27 in March, but <laughs> I started making these videos when I was 23. And honestly, I think I'm turning into a little bit of a cranky old man. My tolerance for stupidity has gone down so much. My irritability has gone up so much and my patience has run so thin, but I think my overall attitude, although I may hide it throughout the day, has gone down in quality. Aside from work performance, just deep down how I feel when I look at other people, it's more fragile than it used to be, and again, that kind of saddens me to think about. I don't want to be one of those people who just has this really black and white, just dull view of the world, but I definitely needed to check this book out in order to add a little bit more color to that and, and you know, bring myself toward a more healthy direction of perspective toward the world. And if you're looking for anything, any type of experience similar to that, I would definitely give this book a go. Direction two. If you like this book, I recommend checking out The Happiness Hypothesis by Jonathan Haidt and 21 Lessons for the 21st Century by Yuval Noah Harari. Factfulness by Hans Rosling, Ola Rosling, and Anna Rosling Ronlund. There's a link in the description if you guys want to check it out and read the reviews. That and any other books that I mentioned in this video as well, if you want to check those out too. If there are any other books that you guys want me to check out and review, please let let me know in the comments below. Also, let me know if you checked out this book and you liked it, but hey, make sure to smash that like button, subscribe if you haven't already, because I don't get why people watch this far into my videos and they don't subscribe, but if you have subscribed and you want to turn it up just a notch and turn on that notification bell to get a notification whenever I drop new videos, that would mean the world to me. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. You can find me everywhere and I will see you then.